Good day to all of our viewers back in the Bay Area, and this is your board secretary from the Air District, John Bowders, and I have with us today Mary Nichols, who is a long has been a longtime chair of the California Air Resources Board, and uh, just recently left that position, but has served under numerous governors and worked in climate, environmental justice, and air uh, pollution control since the early 1970s. And we're really grateful to have you here today, Mary, to talk to us a little bit about your experience here in Glasgow and a couple issues that we think your expertise and knowledge would um, be really beneficial to conversation for people back home. So thanks, first of all, for being here. Absolutely. And our first question, Mary, is just, we're, we're looking at um, a lot of conversation this coming week about transportation and ways to innovate in transportation around trucks and fuels for trucks and technology on trucks. And in California, the California Air Resources Board um, has really been a global leader in identifying uh, ways in moving trucks to a zero emission future. Um, the question I have for you is with that movement that we've already had, is there more to be done in California to help spur um, those types of transitions in other parts of the world? Um, or do you think that the work we've done is already generating those changes? We've really only done half the job. Um, through our regulatory authority, we were able to uh, persuade or compel uh, manufacturers to start designing and offering for sale zero emission trucks that cover multiple categories for the heavy duty sector, uh, all kinds of goods movement ranging from vans up to the largest pieces of equipment that move gigantic containers around at the harbor. But those have to be sold, they have to be put into use. And to do that and to really build a successful market, um, the state and others, including uh, the owners of fleets, have to work together to try to get more of these vehicles out there on the road. Uh, I think everybody knows that uh, when you get a new model out, uh, there's always a few quirks. Most people who want to buy a car wait till that new vehicle type has been in use for a while to see how it works. That's even more true with trucks and other working vehicles, as they call them, because people aren't buying those because they're cute or of great color. They're, they're working vehicles, and they're part of their livelihood. And so uh, we need to help with that transition, and that means both uh, incentives, which we have, as a state, put money into, uh, and many local districts have come up with funds as well to help place these vehicles in fleets where they can do the most good, uh, or to buy back some of the oldest vehicles and get the zero emission uh, trucks out there. Uh, and we also are gonna have to, I think, do some more regulation to make sure that the people who are, especially the larger uh, fleets, are actually uh, required to clean up their overall uh, fleet. So um, it's, a, it, it's not yet done. Oh, we have some work to do. All right, well, we got a good start. And um, speaking of new starts, the Biden administration and the U.S. federal delegation uh, a few days ago announced after the infrastructure bill was adopted that there was a number of um, other priorities in the climate change space that they were really excited about. And one of those discussions, um, Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island talked about the federal carbon tax bill and indicated that they were within a vote of um, securing a majority of support for some version of a, a carbon tax that would be an equalizer, as they said, with other countries in the world for how we, how we metric this. And our question is that, what do you think are the implications for the California cap and trade program? Um, if that bill was to pass, uh, you know, California, you know, came out early in, in, in being among the first places in, in the North American continent to do stuff like this. And with the federal law, you know, kind of taking control of that at some point, how does that impact cap and trade? Well, in, indirectly, of course, it will have an impact on what the price of allowances would be under the California cap and trade program uh, as people evaluate uh, whether they're going to buy allowances or do more to clean up their operations. Um, I, I think people sometimes forget that the cap and trade program is in effect a type of tax. That's why we got a two-thirds vote in the legislature to authorize it, to make sure that it wasn't going to be a tax because of having failed to comply with our constitutional requirements in California. Um, so 
to answer the question directly, you really have to know what the federal tax actually looks like. Um, is it something small? Is it huge? Uh, who, who, has, who will be subject to it? You know, how will it be actually administered? Um, and uh, without knowing that, I can't predict exactly what would happen. But um, I have thought for a long time and had discussions with California legislators about this going back many years uh, that uh, when the federal government finally moves to put a price on carbon, then we'll have to look at the California program and, and its future uh, in that light and see how they mesh together. But, you know, in several uh, parts of the world, they have both a cap and invest or cap and trade program and a carbon tax, and there's no reason why you can't do both. P economists who specialize in taxation will tell you that the theory is that you should tax bad things, not good things. And so uh, from the very beginning, we've had advisors from our own uh, academic institutions in California telling us that what we should do is both do the cap and trade program and have a carbon tax that would actually replace other taxes that are more regressive, like sales taxes or uh, employment taxes, for example. So once you start to open up that box, you can all kinds of things are possible, and we just have to look at them. Well, thank you very much. And uh, last question for you is uh, just about the overall uh, experience here at the COP26. What are your um, thoughts, aspirations, hopes for outcomes here, just at a large scale? What do you think um, is possible and what are you hoping to see? Well, first of all, um, I hope folks back home understand that none of us are in the room where the negotiations are actually happening and where the negotiators are is something we only hear about secondhand or when they come out and make announcements. So we are not exactly up to the minute on what they're talking about. But I think we do know that um, in terms of the actual agreement that will follow on with the Paris Agreement, there will be greater commitments in terms of what individual companies countries are pledging to do uh, to meet the goals that were set in Paris. So the goal of getting to uh, zero carbon is uh, enshrined in an agreement. It's not an enforceable agreement because the UN doesn't have the authority to take a country to court or punish them if they don't meet it, but the countries hold each other accountable. And there's been a lot of announcements here over the last week that people have come in with in terms of better forestry practices, better management of agricultural emissions, methane, which is extremely important that we really get a start on fast. Uh, and these are all going to be reflected in the final wording of the agreement that'll come out of all of this. So that's what the process yields. But from the point of view of those of us who come here, we're not just trying to have an impact on the people that are in the room. Uh, we could probably do that staying back at home and it would be a lot easier in many ways. But I think we come here because we understand that cities, regions, states, private sector, NGOs, all of us are having to play a role to make these huge transitions that we're talking about. We can't just leave it up to national governments and expect them to solve the problems for us. And so the information sharing that goes on here, the bragging and stealing, as we call it, <laughs> each other uh, from each other, um, these are actually valuable and important things to learn. And while California, I think, is justifiably uh, proud of many accomplishments that we made early on, we can't expect people to just know about those things or you know, be constantly looking at our websites to follow everything we do. We have to come and talk to people about it and share the experiences and what we've learned from them and where we wish we might have done things differently earlier on. So um, we're part of a worldwide movement and um, we're playing our part in helping to hold up the uh, other states and regions around the world. Well, Mary, thank you so much for your uh, work over the last 50 years and being such a critical part of that. Um, many years as the chair of the California Air Resources Board. Nice to see you here in Glasgow. Okay. Thank you so much for making time for us. And nice. to everybody back home, um, it is rainy, but Mary uh, took 
took a step away from her pot of tea, which looked quite <laughs> delightful, to join us. And we thank her for being here today. Thank Pleasure. you, Mary.